In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So I'm going to start off with two stories and see if we can catch the common theme between them. First one is an American folklore story. Anybody hear of John Henry before? You nod your head. Nobody nodded. All right, so I learned this actually from reading this book to my kids, but he's American folklore, where John Henry was known as one of the greatest railroad workers to ever work the line. And he was a massive man whose production was unequaled by anybody. And it was around the time when engineers were trying to figure out how to make laying railroad tracks more efficient. And so they were building machines, and these machines had to drill through the side of a mountain. And John Henry is so big that he can use two hammers, one in each hand, while the average person could only manage one hammer. And he would go swinging with both hands to get through. But when he heard that engineers had developed a machine to begin to drill through, all right, he was enraged. He couldn't accept that a machine could do the work better. And so he posed a contest. And the contest was simply to see who can go further, the machine or him. And so they started off and they started the competition. The machine got to about three meters in and then it broke down. But John Henry continued to go and swing both of his hammers and he won, and he beat out the machine by about a, a full meter. But after the completion, he walked out of the cave, looked at everybody, collapsed and died. He won, but he, he collapsed and died. That's story one. Story two, let's go back to the American Revolution. All right? So in 1776, there was a pivotal battle between the British troops and the colonials who were seeking their independence. Battle of Bunker Hill. All right? I can only pick it out from vague memories of social studies, all right? which I was half asleep during those classes. But the Battle of Bunker Hill was a really important one because it gave a vantage point to whoever controlled it to see the harbors as well as kind of overlook Boston. All right? So the colonials had Bunker Hill. But the British troops, who outnumbered the Colonials two to one, were approaching, and they knew that this hill was pivotal. But the Colonials sat behind the barricades, and they started to just shoot from a distance. And they took out nearly half of the army of the British soldiers, right? but the British soldiers had more, they were outnumbered, and so they just kept on coming, wave after wave. And by the third wave, the Colonials had run out of ammo. So they retreated. They had no chance. Once they ran out of ammo, the battle was done. But the British continued to pursue, and they eventually got Bunker Hill. But the casualties were enormous. And they were far away from home. So their ability to replenish was not they didn't have an ability to replenish. But while they got Bunker Hill, Bunker Hill was a key vantage point. But in order to make it worth it, they also needed the next hill, Dorchester Hill. Right? But they didn't have the people. They didn't have the resources. And we know when we play out the war, we know that the colonials eventually won, and that's how America got its independence. But in both of these stories, there's a common thread, right? There is a key battle, right? And people in both stories went after the win of this battle. But they would both go on to lose the war. John Henry lost the war of his life, and the British soldiers would lose this war and have to go back, and America would gain its independence. We can win the battle, but is winning the battle worth it when we lose the war? It's one of the greatest war strategies there are, all right? And, and generals and leaders of the armies have to understand this, that sometimes you have to give up the battle in order to win the war. But while it is a war strategy, it's also an important strategy for us because there are several battles that we have to lose in order 
to win the war. There are spiritual battles that we have to lose, all right, in order to win the war. And if we look at today's gospel, it captures this, all right, it captures this. So let's go to today's gospel. And just if I could set it up, so today's gospel is again kind of following the theme of the baptism of Christ. And after the baptism of Christ, John continued to baptize, all right? But after Jesus came back and he started his ministry and there were some followers, he did some baptizing. His disciples did some baptizing. Jesus himself did not, but his disciples were. And that's where we pick up the story in John chapter 3, where it says Jesus had come back to Judea with his disciples and they were baptizing. And there arose a bit of a dispute between the disciples of John the Baptist and what John, in, in the Gospel of John, calls a Jew, all right? And when we kind of read into this a little bit more, most likely that this Jew was somebody who was baptized by, by one of the disciples of Jesus, and they were saying like, okay, what's the difference between these two baptisms? All right? And the disciples of John the Baptist didn't like this. St. John the Gospel writer, like, puts it nicely saying there rose a dispute. Really, like when we read into this, like this was a heated dispute. And the disciples of John the Baptist got all worked up about this. And so they came to John because they needed to solve this. They needed to figure out how to work through this. They were upset. And so in John 3, 26, it says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Right? There's a battle here for the disciples of John the Baptist. But the question we have to answer is what are they battling? Right? There is a battle here. They are arguing with this Jewish fellow who likely was baptized by the disciples of Christ. Right? And John's disciples don't like it. They don't like it because John was a focal point leading up to the coming of Christ. John was known in the area. So there's a battle of popularity. There's a battle of popularity between the disciples of John and the disciples of Christ and those who are beginning to follow. There's also a battle of self-worth and self-value because their baptism is now being questioned. Their baptism is now being challenged, saying, is it all that it's cracked out to be? Why is your baptism so important versus the other baptism? And so they're trying to say, like, we're the disciples of John. This is the baptism. But it's also a ba battle of pride. There's a battle in pride in this. And we know it's a battle of pride because look at the way the disciples of John described Christ. Right? What did they say? He who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified. They referred to him in such a general way. They were trying to downplay it. The one you spoke about. Right? They're trying to put Jesus down on a lower level, almost as a level as them, as just a disciple. Right? The one you talked about him, but they really didn't say the one whom you baptized, because had they said the one that you baptized, because if they said that or described Jesus in that way, then they would have had to account for the voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son. But they didn't want to deal with that. They didn't know how to reconcile that. So how did they do? They approached it in a very as light a way as possible. They tried to bring Jesus down to their level. So there's a battle of pride and there's a battle for glory. Right? These disciples of John wanted the glory. They wanted people to see them. And when they saw that people were no longer looking at them and now looking at Christ, and his disciples, and what Christ is doing, they felt like something was being taken away. It was glory that was being taken away. Acknowledgement that it was being taken away from them. And so John the Baptist, I know there's a couple of Johns that I always refer to, but John the Baptist, 
speaks to them. If we go to the next slide. And he speaks to them seeing their passion and desire for glory. And John knows that if they continue fighting this battle for glory, they will lose the war. He knows that if they continue to fight this battle for their own glory, they will lose the war. And so in verses 27 and 20, it says, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. John was telling his disciples in a nice way that, look, you want to fight this battle? You will lose because you are fighting against none other than God himself. And no one wins that battle. You will not win. You want to fight for your own glory? Good luck. You, you will win some battles, but you will lose the war. And the war in this context is their salvation. If they don't fight the battle against their passion, if they don't fight the battle against their own desire, they will lose something greater. What John is also trying to tell them is like, look, Everything that we have has been given to us. We have nothing. Right? He saw himself for who, like, for who he was. He knew that he was just the forerunner. He knew that he was called to do this job. And he knew that had God not prophesied, had God not given him this mission, he would have nothing. John knew he was never to be the focal point or to remain the focal point. He knew that he was supposed to come, do something, and then fade. He saw his life for what it was. And so when we look at this idea of vain glory, all right, I want to try and define it a little bit more. A lot of the church fathers have tried to, have offered up a different, uh, different definitions. John, St. John Cassian says, it's a burning thirst for secular glory. All right? It's a burning thirst for secular glory. Evagrius of Ponticus says, vainglory involves fantasizing about social encounters, desire for privilege, the ultimate title, slavery to praise. He also gives another definition where he says, vainglory is associated with the pleasure of thinking about being honored by others. This is vainglory, right? This is battle that the disciples of John were fighting. But we see this fight in our everyday lives, right? While we see it in the disciples of John, we see it in our own lives. And we see it in a variety of different ways. We see it in the ways that we may seek out recognition at work, but we do so through dishonest means, right? When we seek out recognition at work, but we do it dishonestly. That's vainglory. Right? When one spouse appears to be the nice parent in front of the children or in front of others, right? That's seeking vainglory. Because they're sacrificing the truth and doing what's right for recognition or being perceived in a certain way. Right? Students, we can seek vainglory when we cheat, when we cheat and we take shortcuts and we do things that we know go against academic honesty, we're doing it because we want some sort of recognition that we haven't worked for. We also see it in service. We see it in service because servants can make compromising decisions among those they're serving in order to be perceived in a certain light. Right? the cool servant or this one is so much fun we also can serve in a way that just brings attention to ourselves rather than towards God all these different ways right is how vain glory slips into our lives and it's so smooth and sometimes we're unaware of our pursuit of vainglory. We've all been in the conversation, talking with a bunch of friends, and we say something, 
that is out of character of us, where the words come out and we're like, oh, why did I say that? But we're all at the same time looking around and saying, I wonder who noticed. I wonder if I caught the attention of this person. All these different things are how vain glory comes into our lives. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful about it, if we're not vigilant about it, it becomes a deep passion in the negative sense. I use passion in the negative sense here. It becomes a deep passion that will push us and, and, and drag us down a very, very dark hole where all of our pursuits, all of our energies are there to pursue vain glories. So the question is, how do we become aware of this and how do we deal with vain glory? One of the biggest things that we need to do is to acknowledge that I seek out vain glory. We have to acknowledge that. As humble as some of us may be, all of us, given our human nature and desires and the society we live in, are prone to seeking out for vainglory. But in addition to acknowledging it, we have to become aware of ourselves. We really have to become aware of, of who I am. All right? And if we go to the next slide, John the Baptist knew this. All right? And I, I referred to this. But he captured it in verse 30 where he says, he must increase and I must decrease. John knew his place. John knew his place. He knew that like he wasn't supposed to be there. And he knew that if he didn't know that, he would have been talking to his disciples and saying, yeah, I don't know why he's going and baptizing. We should go and talk to him about this. We're the ones baptizing first. But because John knew that Jesus was supposed to increase and he was supposed to decrease, he knew. And that, and that knowing brought about a humility. And we need to also see our life for what it really is. Okay? We need to see ourselves and who we are, but we, but we also need to see what our life is for. And not what our life is for, but how... Let me just use, let the Bible say it. Next, next slide. The Bible says it much better than me. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. How many of us think of our life in this terms? How many of us think our life is just like it's here and it's gone? It's so insignificant when you look at the great picture of this world and the number of people in this world, right? Our, life's is, insig our life is insignificant. But at the same time, it is also very significant to our Lord. All right? But we have to put it into context. It doesn't mean our Lord doesn't care for us and doesn't want each one of us personally. He does. And He died for us. And He proved that to us. But at the same time, our life is just a vapor. It's here and it's gone. And if all we do is battle for our own glory, it's kind of a pointless battle. We lose something greater. And just to give context to this last one, St. John, John Chrysostom spoke about what happened to John the Baptist. And he said it, said it like this. You can tap one over. He said, I think that the death of John was allowed and that it happened very quickly in order that the whole attention of the multitude might be shifted to Christ and that they might no longer be divided in their opinions concerning the two. St. John Chrysostom looked at John the Baptist's life. The one who was called the greatest born among women and said, I think he was taken out early so as to not confuse people. When we look at like great leaders, what do we want great leaders to do? To remain to be there, to lead us. John the Baptist was one of the greatest. But he was taken out of the way. Why? Because the glory wasn't for John. The glory was for Christ. And if we do things that seek out our own glory, we, be, we can lead people astray from Christ. And so, while John was great, his life was but a vapor. 
It was there and it was gone. And it served to point people towards Christ. All of us are fighting this battle of vainglory. And if we pursue it to win, we may win a battle. We may get the recognition. We may get the position. We may get the grade. We may get the acknowledgement of others. But in pursuing that, we may also forfeit the war. The war for our salvation. The war for eternal life. And that is one war we don't want to lose. And so challenge yourselves that in the moments where you feel you want recognition, in the moments where you feel yourself beginning to act in a certain way in order to draw attention, remind yourself it's a battle for vainglory. Pull back and pass it up because you'll be taking a step towards winning the war. And winning the war for us is eternal life. So we'll take a minute and meditate on that and glory be to God forever. Amen.